I would really like to introduce you to Whitney, who's here to tell you about herself and her experiences. And I just, my great pleasure to introduce you to Whitney Munn. Thank you. Hi. Thanks, Liz. Hi, everybody. How are y'all doing? Um, doing well, thank you. Just so you know a little bit um, about my style, I'm really informal. Um, so please interrupt me if you have questions, if you want to know more, if I didn't explain something well, just stop and let me know, okay? Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about me as we go through the presentation. Um, some of the things that I'm going to talk to you about are some of the things that you've probably heard already. Um, but they're an important piece of who I am, so I wanted to share them with you. Um, I know that y'all are working on leadership skills and what it takes to be a leader. Some of the same things resonate for a reason. Um, some of the same things you're hearing from people are the same things for a reason. Um, so pay attention to some of those same themes that you hear because if you pay attention to the same themes, those are things that if you start to emulate yourselves, you'll really become really great leaders in this city, in this nation, in this world. Um, I know you've heard this term before from some of your other speakers who have had the pleasure of listening to their lectures um, online, but pay it forward. Familiar term? Nope. No. All right, if I say pay it forward, what in the heck does that mean? Okay, good, exactly. The notion that you're gonna help somebody else, they may not have helped you, but you're gonna help them, and the idea is that maybe they'll help somebody else. We're gonna talk a little bit more about this. Movie actually is based on a book, um, and we'll talk about that too. It's a really good book. So for me, pay it forward, what in the heck does that mean to me? Anyone familiar with the quote, to whom much is given, much is required? Yeah. Never heard it before. Nope. To whom much is given, much is required. Yeah. What does that mean? Not talking about money here. OK, respect. What else? Anything else resonate when you hear that? Yeah. You want something, you have to put effort into it too. For me, one of the things that resonates when I hear that is I'm very blessed. And as a result, I need to bless others. Not being religious when I'm saying that, but we are very, very blessed to live in this country. We're very blessed to go to a school like this, even though you have stuff that you hate or things that seem really unfair and we have a lot of inequalities in this country, we're still very blessed and there's still something that you can be thankful for every day. So one of the things that's been um, important to me as I've encountered hardships in my life is to try to remember that no matter how badly things seem to suck, there's always somebody who probably has it worse or maybe somebody who has a, is having a worse day than me Somebody once said, you know, Whitney, everybody's got their own bag of rocks. And you may, not, you may think that the other person's bag of rocks is one that you'd rather carry than your own, but you've never carried it. So be not quick to judge because you just never know. Let me tell you a little bit about um, me um, and how pay it forward for me has become a theme that's been important in shaping who I've become as Whitney Munn. Um, I really loved high school, had a great experience in high school, had a really tight-knit group of friends. Um, we actually were really cool and like had known each other since elementary school. I still keep up with all of them um, from my little core group today. Was really involved in high school, had really excellent teachers for the most part. We always know there's going to be a few that aren't going to be on your top of your list, um, but really excelled. If you were to ask me in high school, Whitney, what do you want to be when you grow up? First answer was going to be teacher. Second answer was going to be child psychologist. Why? I'm not so sure about that second one. Um, my mom was a teacher. So for me, that's sort of what I had as a model. Went to college. I went to UNC Chapel Hill. Anybody a Tar Heel fan? Oh, Duke. Oh, so sorry. OK, good. That's all right. As long as we aren't Duke fans, we're cool. Thank you. All right, well done. Thank you, Royston. Um, so I thought when I got to college, I'd continue on that path to be a teacher. I kind of had it all mapped out, right? I was going to go in freshman year. I had some fun. 
all of a sudden I was a very small fish in a very big pond. Like 20,000 people at Carolina. I was used to a pretty small uh, high school environment. I grew up in North Carolina. It's a lot smaller school than this. I only had 200 in my graduating class. Um, went to Carolina. Thought that I was going to apply to the School of Education at Carolina. Get in. Get my teaching certificate and go and teach. Great. I was going to change lives. I was going to work with students just like you. Except I wanted to teach elementary school. Um, I'm wearing heels today, but as you probably can tell, I'm pretty short. So I was intimidated by teaching anybody older than elementary school because I wanted to at least be taller than somebody in my classroom. But guess what? I didn't get into the School of Education at Carolina. Mm -hmm. Oh, what am I going to do? Right? Mm -hmm. So I decided I needed to recalibrate. I could either transfer and go somewhere else, mm -hmm. try to get into the School of Education there. I could change my major. Stick it out at Carolina and find something else, um, or drop out altogether, which was really not the option, right? That's, this, these are my options as I saw it at the time. So what I decided to do was declare my major in US history, graduate, and then get a job teaching through a non-traditional path. OK, great. Got it all mapped out, no problem. I was fortunate enough to study abroad my junior year of college. Had an internship in London, England, taught school, took two classes, had the time of my life, and realized, you know what? I probably don't want to teach. I really loved the students, but I saw another part of the world. And I realized that maybe I wanted to try something else. But it freaked me out, because my whole life, I thought that that's what I was going to do, teach. No problem. Check, I've got my roadmap. And then all of a sudden I was thinking, oh wait, maybe I don't want to teach, but I really like students. What am I going to do? Then there was also this whole pressure because I only had, I knew, my parents said from the very beginning, Whitney, you have four years. You're not going to be one of those fifth year seniors in college. You got four years, get it done, that's it. You are not going to sort of be in this five year, six year, then you graduate plan. We're going to figure it out. You're going to have summer jobs to help pay for college. You're going to take extra hours. going to do what it takes, work hard, get done, get out in the real world. So I also knew I was under the gun because some of my friends had that luxury of, well, I'm going to stretch it out a little bit. So graduated from UNC, um, graduated in, one of the top, in the top of my major, but I still didn't really know what I wanted to do. And guess what? I needed a job because I needed to pay the bills. So I moved to Atlanta, interviewed at Kilpatrick Stockton, started in the Human Resources Department. I know you heard from JJ who talked about being a gopher. Mm -hmm. I was pretty much a gopher. I was a file clerk. I did all the stuff that no one else wanted to do. And I was miserable. But I was making a paycheck. And that helped me pay my bills. It helped me not be under my parents' roof. Um, I slowly started to get to do other things, proved myself, worked hard. The first year, uh, it was all I could do to get out of the bed to go. But I developed really great relationships with people. And that is the key, is the relationships that you build with people, how you treat people. People don't forget. They do remember. Are you the one that was real rude to them the first time you met them? Were you rude when they were trying to talk to you and you didn't pay attention? Or were you the person that expressed interest, paid attention, asked questions, worked hard, did what, you, what was asked of you, and that they wanted to sort of you know, help you out? So I was, thankfully, able to be helped out by some of my colleagues because I had worked hard. And I became the person that was organizing the volunteer projects on the side for, with my colleagues. So I was the one that would say, hey, y'all, let's volunteer. Let's go on the weekends. We're all colleagues. We're all friends. We're going to go and volunteer with the Boys and Girls Club or at Hands on Atlanta Day. We're going to go help in the community. The managing partner at the firm at the time, which is essentially the CEO, except in a law firm, we don't call them the CEO. They run the place. He was really, really committed to community service. And I thankfully developed a really good relationship with him, which is pretty cool. Because remember I told you I was the low man on the totem pole? I was doing all the grunt work. 
But I would pass him in the hallway and talk to him or catch him on the elevator. Bill, hi, it's great to meet you. How you doing today? How's your family? Got to know him however I could. Thought of all sorts of things and excuses of ways that I could get to talk to him. So along this time, the firm was starting to more formalize its work in the community. They hired somebody to lead all of our pro bono legal services. Does anybody know what pro bono means? Nope. Free. Means for free. For free legal services for people who can't afford lawyers. Lawyers are expensive. And not everybody can afford a lawyer. But in this country, we're all entitled to fair legal representation. So our firm is incredibly committed to ensuring that everyone has fair legal representation. So we decided that we would make an incredible commitment to offering pro bono services to people who met our criteria. So we hired a full-time pro bono partner who did nothing but coordinate all of our pro bono services throughout the United States. And I saw it as an opportunity. And I said, well, you know what? Not all of us are lawyers. Not all of us can do pro bono work. I'm not a lawyer. I'm the girl who wanted to be a teacher and is trying to figure it out. But what can we do for all the people who aren't lawyers who might want to serve in the community? So I put together a business plan of creating a position that would be responsible for coordinating all of our non pro bono work in the community for the entire United States. And I presented it to the managing partner and my boss, who was the director of human resources at the time. And because of the relationships that I had developed with the managing partner and my boss by proving myself, they liked it. This meant, and y'all can imagine, if you got the news that you know, you're in this miserable job, you put together a lot of time and effort putting together a business plan for a new position, you present it, and they say yes, what do you think I was doing on the way home? I was so pumped. I wasn't going to have to go to work every day and be miserable anymore. I was so excited. So I started that next week at the age of 27 at the time and was, became the manager of community relations for seven US offices and was responsible for creating an employee volunteer program for all of those offices and figuring out which organizations and schools were we going to work with in all of our communities throughout the United States to help give back as employees of Kilpatrick Stockton. Two years ago, my job morphed even further, and now I'm the Associate Director for Corporate Social Responsibility. What in the heck does that mean? Anybody want to take a guess? I don't even want to try to stretch my brain. Like don't want to stretch your brain? <laughs> it's the end of the day. Yeah, it's almost time for exams to be done. You're ready for a holiday. I hear you. All right, so basically what it means is companies or corporate America have an obligation as businesses in the community to give back or pay it forward, okay? So this whole notion that had been instilled in me my entire life of paying forward, being responsible for what's been given to you and helping others who may not have the same has now become a career for me. I didn't know that it was so much a part of my passion until I've been able to really get into it as a career. I've always volunteered. My grandmother started a nonprofit when I was a kid that gave Christmas presents away to low-income children in a community. And I got to go and I got to help her. So from a very young age, I've been doing volunteer work. But now I get like paid to do work in the community and I get to work with students like you guys I get to work with the students um, that I worked with at Washington High School. And it's absolutely the most incredible thing I've ever, ever experienced. So the message behind that, and the reason I tell you all that stuff, and I don't mean to bore you, is that it's important to have goals. It's an important to have a dream. But it's also important to recognize that that might change. And that's OK. But what really matters is what's at the foundation of who you are as a person and how is that going to help to shape your decisions. So for me, the notion of giving back has always been an important component of who I am. And it's still an important component of who I am as a professional and as a non-professional, as a friend, a colleague, a mother of two dogs. I don't have children. Um, I want to introduce you to some of the people that I've met along my journey. And then we're going to come back to this notion of paying it forward. So these are my kids. 
This is in front of Washington High School. I don't know if y'all have ever played them in sports. Right, rivals, okay, I got it. Awesome, well she, I don't think is in my, my picture. All of these kids, this is our last day of mentoring at Washington High School in the spring, in May of 2010. We started with this group of students when, we were, when they were freshmen, and we stayed with them as mentors all four years of high school. Um, some of the mentors are mixed in. You can see me down there. Um, uh, we are going to have a reunion on Monday when they all come back from college. This group of students started as the bottom 150 from a test, eighth grade test score perspective of the incoming ninth grade class of 2006 at Washington High School, okay? They were the kids that everyone said, mm-mm, they aren't gonna make it. They probably aren't gonna be here by the time they're seniors. I don't think that they're gonna cut it. And the firm said, no, we want to see you here as seniors. And we weekly came over, met with them. I know that Ms. Lieberman is doing the exact same thing, coming over, trying to help you all, believing that you can make it, and helping to make sure that you know that you can make it. This group of students, all but one of them, graduated from high school in May, on time. The one who didn't finished in summer school because he had to take that GGT exam one more time. Collectively, they received more than 330 scholarships, valued at more than $8.5 million. And they are all in college, except for one who's chosen to go into active military service, and one who's chosen to defer because he wanted to save money for college first. These are your peers. These are people who are really similar age to you. And these are my family members, OK? Um, let's see if I can. All right, the, these are the boys that I mentored every week. Same group. Torrance, Jeremy, and Jeremy. We took them all on a trip to DC. Um, Deontay. Some of you may know Deontay Bridges or have seen his graduation speech on YouTube. It went viral. It was a great, great speech. This young man is now at UGA, and he alone got more than a million dollars in scholarships. Okay. One of the things that's really important to understand about Deontay is that he is the first African-American male to graduate as valedictorian from Washington High School more than 10 years. Okay, he did not sit in the classroom and think, I can't do it, I'm not gonna make it, I'm never gonna be anybody. He really did what wasn't cool. This guy's a really amazing basketball player. He loves to ball on the weekends, he's really good. But he decided that academics were going to be the way that he was going to get anywhere. He knew that he wasn't as good as he was compared to everybody else that was playing on the basketball team at Washington, that basketball wasn't going to be the way that he was going to earn his keep. He knew he wasn't going to be good enough to make it to the NBA as much as that sounded really cool. And he realized that academics were going to be more important. So he decided he was going to do the uncool thing and try to study up. The other thing that he did, which is why I became really close to Deontay, is that he really, really understood the importance of paying it forward. This young man was really involved in his community. There's a boys and girls club right up from where his apartment is. And he would go and volunteer playing basketball so he could get it in somehow with the kids on the weekends. He ultimately got a scholarship. I think I'm going to misquote the numbers, so I'm not even going to offer. But I know he got at least five scholarships for his community service, for the notion that he was going to pay it forward. He wasn't doing it and not volunteer. He wasn't volunteering to try to get the money. He was doing it because he felt like it was the right thing to do. And quite frankly, other people had helped him when he was a kid at that same Boys and Girls Club. And what happened? It turned into scholarship money. That volunteering turned into money that helped him go to college for free. Okay? So that's something to remember this notion of paying it forward. This is Nairobi, Kenya. I just returned from there in September, OK? Um, this is, you turn off of a paved street in Nairobi. 
And off the main thoroughfare, this is what you see. This rocked my world when I went and saw this kind of poverty. I was not prepared for it. I had seen it on TV. I had seen it in movies. I had seen it in pictures. I would heard people talk about it. You see the ads, especially this time of year. But I was not prepared. When we talk a lot about paying it forward and the fact of to whom much is given, much is required, it's very easy for us to think that there is a lot of inequality. But when I saw this, that paradigm completely shifted for me. OK? Some other pictures of my journey. This is the school. This is the center. We, we worked in a boarding school and a preschool um, and in a slum area of Nakuru, Kenya, which is about two and a half hours away from that picture I just showed you. Um, the engineer who built the school did not get the elevation right. So every day when it rains, and it rained every day that we were there, this courtyard here fills with mud. And the students take turns spending 45 minutes shoveling the mud back into the courtyard and so that they don't track it all through the school. This is considered university level housing in Kenya this could, in, in a school. So it's a boarding school. Not everybody comes as a boarder. Some people come as a day student. But this is considered top of the line. Cream of the crop, OK? All right, at the back of that school that I just showed you, this is the primary school. This is their elementary school, OK? So kids from our equivalent of kindergarten to fifth grade are in this building. These sheds over here are where they keep the goats, OK? That's what they use to help feed the students, all right? Some goats and eggs and kale and something that they serve on Wednesdays, which is called sukumawiki, which means get through the week. It's kale. Meat is a rarity. The reason I'm showing you these things is because I want you to understand the importance of paying it forward, OK? It's really important for you to get the notion that as leaders in this community, which I consider you all, that you never know who can give you a leg up, right? You, never, you don't need to do things with an expectation. I didn't go to Kenya to help these kids because I think that they're somehow going to do something for me in return. It's not why I went. What's interesting to me about my journey is that they ended up helping me more than I ever anticipated. They taught me the importance of gratitude. They taught me the importance of humility. They taught me the importance of this notion of paying it forward. You don't know how much one act that you do can help someone else. OK? Gratitude, yep. So did they like eat the goats? Did they eat the goats? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. They did. Goats. They used it to get milk. They used it for the meat. Mm -hmm. um, this is my favorite moment of the trip. Right here. It happened. I thought it was going to be, we went to build a greenhouse. All right, we got the greenhouse up. We went to help at the boarding school. All right, we taught some lessons. The kids learned something. That was awesome. All right, we helped at doing a feeding program for a preschool um, and in another slum neighborhood. Those are the moments that I thought were going to be the highlights for me. I went expecting, yeah, I'm going to do something. I'm going to be able to give it back. It's going to be great. Turns out, this is my favorite moment of the trip. What? That little boy who you saw, and I don't want to mess with the slide because I, I'm going to jack up my presentation. This little boy was hiding in the corner. Those of you who saw, who don't have your heads down, saw this picture. He was hiding in the corner. He had just wet his pants. If you're a primary school child at this preschool and you don't make it to the outhouse in time, okay, they don't have indoor plumbing. It's a hole in the ground, yeah. okay? You don't make it to the outhouse. You only have one change of clothes. Again, this is this student. This is not all students in Kenya. These are the students that I met. So I don't want to paint a picture that is inaccurate. I'm sharing my experience. 
So I finally was able to develop a rapport with this young man. He's four. And he let me pick him up, comfort him. He was really upset. I would be too. And I held him. It was hot as blazes. And I'm white. I was getting burnt. All right? We sat there for two and a half hours so that I could dry him on my pants. He could be dry for the rest of the day, go home, have a dry pair of shorts to wear, because he won't get to change when he comes back the next day. And he just let me sit there and hold him and love him. I don't even know his name. But I guarantee you that that mattered. I guarantee you that that made a difference. I'm not expecting a thing from this little boy. Nothing. I'll never see him again. You might. I might. You I might. But he won't know. He won't know it's me. And so I think that the, the message for me that I think is really important to all of you is that you have to start somewhere. If there's something that you don't like, be it in your community, in your school, your family, your group of friends, small actions done with the purpose and intent of trying to pay it forward with the spirit of gratitude, with the spirit of humility, really can affect change. So if I am one person, and this is from the book that became the Pay It Forward movie. If I, one person, did something kind to you, what's your name? Dion. Dion, nice to meet you. And you, you're a great artist, by Nina. the way. Nina. Nina. And you? Avanti. 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 All right. So I did something for each of them. Maybe it was something simple, like, I don't know, they didn't have enough money in the lunch line, so I gave them 25 cents. Or maybe they were behind me on the toll going up Georgia 400, and I just paid the 50 cents for them. Or maybe it was something simple like, you know, held open the door. And that made you, who like carrying your books or something, wow, that was really nice. And maybe it makes you want to do something. So if I do that for three people, and then Dion does it for three people, Vanti does it for three people, Nina, right, does it for three people, it exponentially gets bigger. You can affect change that way. It's like that uh, song. It's going to sound like, throw a pebble into water. Take away. Yes. yes. Will you say that louder? Uh, <laughs> I don't know what you uh, Throw a pebble in the water and uh, make a way. Yeah, that's the mm -hmm. Exactly. It's a, it's a small little pebble, but it can cause a ripple effect. OK? So no matter what you're facing, because I know some of you may come from homes that are not good. Or maybe you've had life experiences that have not been incredibly positive. You can make a difference. You still can pay it forward. And there's always going to be something for you that you can be grateful for. And if you always approach things from that spirit, the good will come to you. So you're going to get out what you put in. We talked about that earlier. If you are the one that's always putting the negative energy out there, what are you going to attract? Negative. If you're the one that's known in school for always being the jerk, or the class clown, or the punk, or whatever it is, what do you think you're going to get? How are your teachers, teachers going to act to you? How are your peers going to act to you? Bad. You're probably not going to surround yourself with the right kind of energy. But if you switch that, and you're known as the one who's kind, or at least not boasting all the time, or at least thankful, or humble, things might change for you. I think you should try it as an experiment, because I think you would find that it would really change things for you. Gratitude journal. Has anybody ever heard of a gratitude journal? What in the heck is that? I learned it from Oprah. Go ahead. Like when you write down good things that you do. Good things that you do. Or that happen to you. Or, you see or that you're thankful for. Yeah. yeah. Good uh huh. Could be that. All right. So this is something that my great grandmother actually used to do. 
My great grandmother lived to be 107. She's a cool lady. Um, she used to keep a gratitude journal. I did not know she did this until she died. And she died in 2005. She would write down at the end of every day something that she was thankful for. And on the days that she had a really bad day, she'd write two things down because she needed some extra help. Some days she wrote down air. <laughs> she must have had a really bad day then. <laughs> Some days it was, I didn't burn my toast. Some days it was, the flowers were beautiful when they bloomed today. Some days it was, my family. Some days it was, the car started. Some days it was, I got a bonus at my job because my grandfather, or great grandfather, died when um, my grandmother was 12. So she was, my great grandmother was a primary breadwinner for the family. But she always tried to find something. And she never, ever, ever went to bed thinking about, I, my lights were turned off. This, she lived in the 1920s. So she was born in 1897. So she lived through the Depression. I didn't eat today. Um, you know, I lost my job. My husband died. She always tried to turn it on its end and find something, even if she had to stretch to find it. Because she found that when she put that kind of spirit out, she got something better in return. So I guess the thing that I want to, um, to share with you and the last sort of bit that I want to sort of remind you of, as you think about leadership and the kind of style and the kind of leaders that you want to be, is do you want to be known as the one who's putting out the positive energy to the people you're leading or the organization that you're leading? Do you want your employees or your colleagues or that kind of thing to be doing the same? Or do you want to have that negative energy? Do you want to lead by you know, fear, intimidation? I don't think so. Because I don't think you'd have that many people who want to follow you and for the right reasons. Does anybody here, you know how um, different companies have like a motto or a slogan? Mm -hmm. Give me some of them that you know. Nike, just, just do it. Just do it. I'm loving it. All right? Walmart, live better. Save money, live better. Okay, good. So y'all are all paying attention to generic marketer's dream. <laughs> there you go. That's a, I'm hearing that one a lot with the holidays, aren't we? All right, so if I asked you. Oh, Pokemon, gotta catch them all. Okay, if you had to decide what your motto is, think about it. What would you want your motto to be? Anybody? It takes time, absolutely. And you don't necessarily have to have the answer right now. Do you want, what's yours? What's it? Laugh it off. All right, good. That's good. All right, so as you go into this holiday season, I think, how many juniors do we have? Yeah, all right, seniors? Ah, wow, big man on campus. And women. Sophomores? All right, freshmen? Cool. Oh, stop. Y'all were all freshmen once. Um, I want you all to think about what you would want your motto to be. Okay? For you, yeah, just each of you as individuals. You don't have to write it down, not to think about it, say it out loud, but I want you to think about what your motto is. I had to do this for a leadership class that I went through, and it was really difficult, but it made you think about who you are, what your values are, what are the things that drive you as a person, <laughs> And here's what I came up with. And it's actually, a, it's a quote from a Jewish rabbi. A Jewish rabbi, and I'm not Jewish, but I thought it was really awesome. All right, and the quote is, if not me, who? If not now, when? Okay, if not me, who? If not now, when? So, it's up to you. You have the ability to take the action, 
to effect change, my hope for you is that you're going to be like the pebble in the water, the positive pebble in the water that's creating a ripple effect, that you will remember to pay it forward as you do that, and remember others, because you never know, and I heard JJ say this in his talk to you, you never know who's going to be able to help give you a leg up. You never know where that help is going to come from. So if you can always remember to have that spirit of gratitude and humility and helping others, you absolutely will go far. Um, I have tons of other pictures. I have tons of time to answer questions. Um, does anybody have any questions? First of all, before you ask questions, I just, God, you are so great. And I really want to, I definitely think we need to show you how great this was and how much we appreciate it. And I have a question for all of you, and I want you to ask Whitney your questions. Does anybody remember when Dennis Brosnan was here? He's the CEO, the chief executive officer that was talking to you, and he talked about getting, how would you get in touch with him? And several of the other speakers for this class have talked about how do you meet somebody? How do you think I met Whitney? Who wants to guess? Facebook, okay. Yeah. MySpace, Facebook. Yeah. Coffee Club, community yeah. service. Yeah. Who else? Who Mutual else wants friend. to guess? Mutual yeah. friend. <laughs> so, so do you want to know how we met? Community service. We I'll met, it's yeah, because of community well. service, and now, now she's one of my friends. The way we met is that I read about her in the newspaper, because that's how cool and important she is. And then I, taking my own advice, wrote her a letter. And I wrote a good letter. I think it was a good letter. There was a lot of passion in it. She knew that I meant what I was saying. And we went for coffee within the next week. So there's power, that, and because of that letter and the article about Whitney, she's here talking to you. And that is amazing. So please really pay attention to the fact that if there's somebody that you're impressed with, they will likely be open to meeting you if you just let them know how much you want to meet them. So now, what questions do you have for Whitney? We, we provided our students in our mentoring program scholarships, but we don't, as a firm, provide scholarships. Um, but one of the things that we did do was work with the guidance counselors at the high school, and I guarantee you have them here. Um, and there's actually several different websites that have great scholarships, hundreds of thousands of scholarships out there. There are so many. Oh, my God, it's insane. I'm more than happy to send you the website. It's great. I can't remember off the top of my head. I have it in my, I have it, mm -hmm. I have it in my, um, in my outlook at home. You um, wouldn't believe the number of scholarships that are out there. There are needs-based scholarships, there are merit-based scholarships, which means you have to have a certain criteria, GPA or SAT. But then there's also community-based scholarships. I talked to you about Deontay. He did community yeah. service and got scholarships. There could be something out there from somebody who had an aunt who wore glasses and they want a scholarship for kids who wear glasses. I mean, you would never believe the stuff that's out there. So definitely take advantage of your career services offices because I guarantee you they have a really great sense of what's out there. And don't wait until the last minute either. So one of the things I want to ask you, to, to me you look like someone who exudes confidence. Would you say you have confidence? Um, yes, but I get really nervous inside. So I was really nervous to come here today actually. Um, you know, yeah, I am older than you, and so I guess I should just walk in and have confidence. But um, I don't always. And um, I think it's really important that you learn how to channel your nervous energy. Um, if you could feel my palms, they're a little sweaty. It's a little bit nervous. How are you going to receive me? Are you all going to be asleep? Is anyone going to listen? Um, and so, yeah, I think that um, you have to learn to figure out ways to be confident, even with inside. Perhaps the butterflies are going and you're really nervous. Um, but you just have to figure out how you want to project yourself. And, um, and I don't want anyone to think that I'm not proud of who I am um, or what I have to say. And at the end of the day, you know, hopefully somebody will get something out of it. So. And what, what do you think confidence does? And, and let me tell you where this is coming from. Again, quoting from Dennis Brosnan, he talked about paying it forward, or he likes to call it the hand up. And he talked about the importance of confidence. And what do you think, what role do you think confidence plays in 
success, and let's th again think of, it's not success in terms of dollars all the time, just what, what role do you think it plays in success? Um, well, first of all, to follow up on Mr. Bosch's point, you can't take the stuff with you. So I think that's something else to really remember. It is about the people that you impact. The confidence factor to me plays in because I never would be where I am if I hadn't had a an inner belief that I could do the job. I had to sell this whole concept when I was sort of putting myself out there and creating a business plan and trying to convince the equivalent of a CEO of a company that they needed to take a chance on me. It took a lot of confidence and some guts to be willing to sort of step out there and say, I can do this job. I can do a really good job. And here's how it's going to make a difference to you and the business you are running. You can't do that if you approach it as, hi, um, I was just thinking that maybe like I could have this job and I would do really well. And that's not going to work. It's not going to work. You've got to project the image that you treat this as a profession, that you want them to take you seriously, that you are not afraid, and yet you're respectful. You cannot come in. There's a difference in confidence and being really cocky. So you need to come across as being very confident, but you also can't come across as like you know everything and then some, because that's unattractive. So I think there's an important balance there. Because if someone comes in and is like, I got this, I am all that, you know you want this, who wants to be around somebody like that? You have to be willing to sell the fact that you are going to be able to do a good job, that you believe in yourself, but that you're also receptive to constructive criticism, to new ideas, to working as a part of a team. All those things are really important in business. So you have to figure out how to have a balance. Yeah, thank you. How do you think there's a difference between humility and being humble? Mm -hmm. um, and I can explain why I'm asking yes. if that. Mm -hmm. yep. I run across a lot with clients and a lot of the students in here that they were taught to be humble. And sometimes when I hear about humble, it's said in a way of not my definition of humility, which is not being cocky and, and much more, but more of I can't tell you anything I've done that is good. Mm. And that worries me because I think it's important to have humility because I also, I'm very put off by somebody who comes in and is cocky. But I think it's important to show people what you can do. And that's where I'm concerned about people defining humble as mm -hmm. not saying anything good about myself. This is actually something I really struggle with. Um, you'll notice when you started talking about the 40 under 40, I bristled. Um, it, it is something that I struggle with. Um, and I think a lot of it is because of how I'm wired. And you know, I don't know if it's a Southern thing. Um, I don't know. I don't know where it comes from. Um, I do think that there is a difference. Um, I do think it's important to strike a balance. And it's something that I'm trying to work on because I'm not very good at it. Um, so that's something that actually is, is a work in progress for me. But I do think that there is a difference. Um, and I think it's important that you're able to own the things that you do well, that you've done well, um, in a non-cocky way, um, and be proud of them. And um, I think we're taught that sometimes that's bad. And, um, and I think trying to get comfortable with that being OK and the fact that, yeah, I have accomplished that. I'm really proud of it. It's OK. And what happens so. if you fall down along the way? Hmm. Get back up. I think, um, I think the most unattractive thing is um, people who consider themselves always to just be a victim. And, um, and I think that it's up to us to be in control of our own destiny and not expect other people to always do it for us or that the reason that you can't overcome something is because always things are being done to you. Um, I think that if you look at people who have overcome struggle, I think Nelson Mandela is a perfect example um, you know, he could have easily given up in that prison. And he ended up becoming president of South Africa. Um, so I, I, think that it's, um, I think it's really important to get back up. And the sooner you do, um, the easier that it is um, to sort of effect change, um, personally or professionally. 
Um, and so. I agree. And one thing I'll add, and you guys may have heard me say it before, I think about people who are successful whenever they're interviewed. It's never been easy. It's always been a struggle. So whenever I fall down and I'm really frustrated about it, I remind myself, oh, yeah, you never make it unless you fall down. So this is just, I'm one step closer now to making it. And I try to tell myself that while, while I'm down. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, then I have that struggle of, well, I want to be irritated. But oh, no, this is the first step. Mm -hmm. so. Well, the other thing that, um, that I've learned, because I, um, you know, I told you guys that I really wanted to be a teacher. And I thought I all had it mapped out. And then it kind of took a turn. Um, but one of the things that I realized um, is that the, the more you can understand for yourself, even if you don't have the end goal in mind, though I think it's important to set goals, and I challenge all of you to do it, I challenge all of you to write them down and look back at them and adjust them as needed, because you always need to make room for adjustment. But the more you can get closer to, you know the game you used to play, like, oh, you're getting warmer, oh, you're getting colder, like when you're a little kid and you try to find stuff that were hidden around the room or whatever. The more you as a person can try to do things or surround yourself with people that help you inside feel like you're getting a little bit close to warmer of whatever that goal is, even if you don't quite know what it is, but you're trying to figure it out, instead of doing the things that get you to colder, like, ooh, I know I shouldn't be doing this or hang out with these people, but I'm going to do it anyway, and it's going to be all right. That's more like colder. But if you get to like, oh, you know, I really have a good group of friends, or I feel like I need to stay at home and study for this test even though I really want to go out, or whatever it is, because it's going to help me get to whatever goal I want to achieve. Even if you don't know what that goal is other than it's just, I want to graduate from high school, or I want to get an A in this class. Um, that's a really important thing to learn. So I think there's a nice combination there of, of trying to figure it out along the way. Okay. So one of the things you said is that you would get in the elevator and say, hey, how are you? How are you? How's your family? Did you care how the family was? Um, I did. Um, I truly did. It was not a flip kind of thing. There wasn't just a checklist of questions that I had you know, in my pocket. Um, actually, I got to know a lot of people that I work with, family, through community service. So I got to know their kids. Um, I got to know their wives or their husbands, um, their dogs. <laughs> um, and so you really start to build relationships with them. And, um, and I knew them by name, still do. I've been there 11 years. Um, I'm still at the same place that I started right out of college, which is really an anomaly these days. Yeah. Um, so it's very much become a family, and, um, and I do care. Kilpatrick Stockton, which is a law firm, um, and we're getting ready to merge. So we're gonna have we're gonna be the fourth largest law firm to do intellectual property, which is um, Townsend, Townsend and Crew, which is a San Francisco-based firm. So we'll have 16. As of January 1, I'll be managing 16 offices instead of seven. Um, and So we're we lucky do, she's here today. Yeah. So we do a lot of intellectual property, which is like copyrights and trademarks and patents. So um, we represent a lot of artists and um, companies like Adidas and that kind of thing, doing their branding. So the reason I asked if you cared, mm -hmm. because I knew you did. Mm -hmm. But it points out, it's not just about getting out there and saying, oh, I want to meet you. What can you do for me? It's about caring mm -hmm. and meeting people and connecting with people. And you never know where you're going to end up when you connect with somebody or where they'll end up. If your goal is to just introduce other people to help them meet one another, you still may find that you benefit. So I, I want to go back to the humble and humility question. And this is for you, and this is for everyone in here. Sometimes when we're afraid to showcase what we do well, we end up keeping it inside. And the reason that that's a challenge is that most likely what you're doing is something good. What you do, you, your mission, your brand is to help people. And if you let being humble prevent you from helping people, that's taking away the gift to them of interacting with you. And so what I try to encourage people is, it's very hard to tell people how great you are, and that's not what it's about. But if you don't take the risk of letting them know what you can do, then the gift that you can give them, they never receive. Mm -hmm. And so instead of thinking, it's about me, it's really about what are they not getting if I hold it back. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'd love to offer you, because you do so incredibly much that if you didn't do it, if mm -hmm. you didn't let yourself do it, All these, so many people would be missing out right now. Thank you. And I thought that was an incredible presentation.